All right. And you just uh, finished wrapping up your lengthy, incredible Hulk run. And first off, what would you say, you know, you've had this groundbreaking run that has, you know, gotten a lot of popularity. What would you say were the writers, the stories that influenced you most when you approached it? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, Stan Lee, uh, Peter David, and especially Bill Mantlo are probably the three big writers who influenced me the most. Uh, Bill Mantlo is just... Uh, I, I mean, I always talk about him because he wrote, uh, well, he wrote the Micronaut series, which as a kid was, you know, that was my comics Bible. I just love that so much. But, um, but his, uh, his Hulk work, which I only read as an adult, I didn't actually read much of that as a kid, um, just blew my mind because he had taken all of these elements um, uh, that had been hinted at before and really fleshed them out. So he was the first one, I think, to really um, explore Banner's relationship with his abusive father and, and kind of lay out the backstory about what happened with Banner's mother. Um, and, uh, and he also uh, told this crazy story of the Hulk being exiled from, the, from planet Earth and, and by Doctor Strange, among others. And so there are there many ways in which what, Peter, what, I mean, what uh, Bill Mantelo did um, reverberated through the stories I was telling, from World War Hulk to the stuff I was doing with the Hulk and his sons. Particularly, um, I mean, a few one big issue where a lot of that stuff really came through was uh, Incredible Hulk uh, number six, 611, um, which was, uh, if I'm remembering the number correctly, that's the issue where the Hulk and his barbarian son Scar finally have their big showdown. And um, we, uh, we cut back and forth between that fight in real time and these flashbacks to Banner's um, kind of horrific experiences with his own father. And um, I, I mean, that happened in Incredible Hulk 312 back in the day in that Mantlo book. But yeah, I mean, that Bill Mantlo stuff is just really rich and uh, had a huge influence. I, um, I recommend uh, folks, uh, if you go to, um, you know what, I'll, I'll put up a link on my site because I've been meaning to do this for a while. Bill Mantlo actually right now, uh, he suffered a um, traumatic brain injury in the 90s. He was hit by a hit-and-run driver in New York City. And um, uh, if you want to donate to his ongoing care, um, there's a way to do that. And I'll put up a link on my website. If you go to gregpock.com, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run the link there. Of course. So if you had to look at Banner at the beginning and end of your run, how would you say he has changed as a character? Uh. Or has he? Yeah, well, that's a, you know, that, I mean, he started off in my run kind of um, in that very much like, you know, leave Hulk alone mode. You know what I mean? I mean, we didn't really see Banner. We only saw the Hulk uh, through most of Planet Hulk. Um, but the Hulk, I mean, the Hulk was definitely in that, you know, ah, get out of my face, you know. Um, during the course of Planet Hulk, he began to bond with people these other, um, you know, monsters uh, who had been imprisoned on planet Sakaar and forced to fight in the gladiatorial arenas. And, um, and so this guy who always said he wanted to be left alone suddenly was surrounding himself with these friends to which he totally had bonded and eventually marries on this planet and becomes the emperor of this planet. Um, uh, I don't want to spoil how that ends, but he ends up back on Earth and uh, during the time he's on Earth, he, he ends up again surrounding himself with a family of hulks uh, so i think that during the course of the big overarching theme of this five and a half year storyline i did I, I you know i realized at a certain point it was really about family and about um responsibility towards your family and uh during the course of this whole story the hulk is trying to deal with the fact that he has these family members that he loves and the fact that he is prone to this amazing rage and just by virtue of this incredible strength he has, he puts people in danger just by being around them. And so coming to terms with how to protect his family and love his family, I think, uh, uh, is, I mean, that's, that's really what's going on. I mean, it, by the end of it, he is he's walking away from it all um, but there's a kind of a twist so I, I don't want to spoil it all but but he uh, I mean he comes to an understanding about about how how he reconciles his love of his family with his fear for the safety of his family I think that's that's the big thing that he has to deal with now that the book is being handed off to Jason Aaron did the two of you work together at all to kind of like was it just that you told him, all right, here's where I'm leaving things, or did he tell you any just, here's what I want to do with the character, 
can that fit in with what you're doing? No, I mean he. I mean he clearly saw the you know the last stuff I was doing, and um, and I saw the stuff that he was going for, and I think we both were like awesome. Um, we didn't sit down and have big conversations about it. I think, um, and which which I think makes sense because I think any new writer needs to come on board, look at what's come before, and be able to just kind of deal with all that and 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 pick their new their new journey. You know what I'm saying? So um, I I didn't I I didn't presume to you know to to call him up and say hey you know don't forget this and this and this and you know at this point I, I did what I wanted what I needed to do you know what I mean and 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 I was just so lucky and so grateful to Marvel for having the space to tell the story and to finish it you know what I mean to actually have a real concrete ending and at that point I really wanted to step back and let the next person just do what they needed to do all right well shifting gears currently at Marvel you are doing Red Skull and first of all with these characters, especially in the Marvel Universe, you've got characters like Red Skull and Captain America tied to World War II. You have Frank Castle tied to Vietnam. What role do you think history plays and how important is it to examine the, that role in superhero comics? Well, for some characters, I mean, some characters have, you know, had their history tied to a specific time. And it, I don't think it is essential to the character, like Iron Man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, yeah his original storyline is it's tied to Vietnam, and then that had to, they changed that to let the character be more modern and all that. I think that's fine. I don't think the Vietnam experience is essential to uh, to Iron Man. I think a military situation is essential to those themes, but I don't think it necessarily has to be Vietnam. Captain America, Red Skull, those feel totally ensconced in that World War II experience. There's something, I mean, the, the, the cliche about World War II is the good war. I mean, that's, that's the Studs Terkel book, you know what I mean? That this was a book where the moral imperative to defeat Nazism was absolutely clear. Even though it took the country a long time to get to that point where people accepted that, coming out of it, it's so crystal clear that that had to be done. Um, and I think that is integral to Steve Rogers and what Steve Rogers means um, as this guy who represents the the good fight, you know, um, that kind of and and so he becomes a great foil to use against uh, uh, against uh, um, a modern world where things are often or have a, many more shades of gray, you know. Um, so uh, that becomes. A real challenge in in serial comics that last decades because you've got to figure out reasons why these characters who have their origins, you know, in uh, in the past, uh, appear to be around 30 years old now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so that becomes a challenge. But you know, it's comics. You figure it out. And and the trade-off is that you get this amazing, rich. Um, milieu in which you can tell these stories, like this Red Skull story. I'm just so grateful that I get to do this Red Skull story because um, I, get, I, I get to explore this era before the before Hitler became the Hitler, be, before Hitler became Chancellor, and um, and before the Nazis began their wars of aggression and their genocide. Um, the uh, that 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 time period when Germany, when Weimar Germany was collapsing and the Nazis were slowly rising and then and then rapidly took over, that era is very scary. Um, it doesn't, I mean, you've got constant violence in the streets, you've got bloodshed, you've got assassinations, you don't yet have that unfathomable genocide. But this is where the seeds of all of that get laid. And, um, and I think it just, it, for me personally, just as a human being, I really wanted to learn about this because I think it's just important for us to see, you know, for us to understand how people and societies fall apart and atrocities find their, uh, their roots, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I was just really wanted to, to go into it for those reasons. Uh, in terms of telling a story about... Um, Johann Schmidt, this kid who becomes the Red Skull, it was it was this it was a huge challenge. You know, I mean, I, I was very. I mean, with Magneto Testament, that's also about a Marvel villain whose story happens during the time of the Nazis. But with Testament, we just made the decision. You know what? At this point in time, Max Eisenhart, the boy who will become Magneto, is Max Eisenhart, and he's a hero, and he's he's just a kid who is doing everything he can to save his family. Um, and so, in terms of telling his story. That wasn't, I mean, there were a million challenges with that story, but I had no trouble kind of finding his voice and, and knowing 
you know, in, in, in falling in love with that character and, and, and making him real. You know what I'm saying? Um, I had not written a story about a Nazi before, you know what I'm saying? And so that became a real challenge, which was to honestly, fall, tr honestly try to figure out the steps by which uh, uh, an abused orphan goes from hard to evil, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, without glorifying it in any way, you know what I'm saying? And without sort of prejudging, you know, uh, um, so it, I mean, it's a huge challenge, uh, but it's, it's been a really rich experience and a scary experience. So, I mean, and that's, you know, that's, that's an amazing gift to be able to do this kind of story. Well, you actually touched upon the two questions I was going to, <laughs> two more questions I was going to ask about Red Skull. So for our last and I think most important question, how do you think having to regrow the beard affected <laughs> your, your writing? Did it make it more difficult or? You know, sometimes obstacles are the things that, that you know, that, that kick you in the pants and get you going. I, uh, uh, yeah, I had this terrible, you know, uh, haircut mishap where I, the guy, uh, well, j the, if anybody has a beard out there, never let another man touch your beard. That's, that's just the lesson of the day. I, uh, I was tired, I wasn't paying attention, had my glasses off, can't see, the barber started trimming my beard. I was like, okay, and then the next thing I know, he's giving me a pencil mustache. A loved one told me I looked like a serial killer. <laughs> I'd shave the whole thing, regrow it. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, anything that kind of shakes you up in some ways can can uh, can uh, just just get you thinking, get you moving. So, well, you took that a lot more serious than I thought. <laughs> but thank you very much for talking with us today, and I hope your, the rest of your con is great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and thanks so much for your support over the last few months.